right. Hey, welcome to North Point Plus podcast. This is episode number 127. We're excited to uh, dive in real quickly. But uh, before that, I will just let you know, I am Kim Cordes, just your guest host this week. Looking forward to uh, just going a little deeper with Pastor Rick here on the 12 Steps. And yeah. And we kind of wrapped up. Really. Yeah, we finished the series. But yeah. I guess like the 12 Steps, it just goes forever. Yeah. So you, you yeah. just continue continue to go through the process. You've been gone. I have been gone. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Any, pl- any place exciting? I uh, went to Arizona for work and went to visit my parents in Destin, Florida. So, yeah, both places were very chilly. I did not <laughs> escape the cold. Both places were chilly. They were chilly, like uh, hats, gloves, winter coat. Wow. Yeah, I did get a little bit of a I'm break. I'm so in. sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did get a little sunshine, and I did get a little bit of uh, a break um, for a little bit in Destin, a couple days where it was warm enough. But, yeah, yeah. no, but still, uh, Michigan in January and February is, you know, it's a good place to escape for a little bit. Well, who knows? I, last week it was in the 60s. I know, I, right? So it was right. We had, so yeah, I was here for that. Yeah. That was beautiful. So yeah. I, it's, yeah. And and it seems balmy when it's in the 30s. So that's good. And the sun's out. Yeah, actually. that's yeah. right. Yeah, which is today. So that's been great. So. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you have in front of you today? What do I have in front? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to keep up, you know. Both green and, and do, white. And do you notice that mine are larger than you? Uh, uh, that's because some <laughs> some schools have to try harder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Now it is basketball season. I think that is our sport. It is, and it's I certainly did, not Ohio State. I did see They're, that you did squeak by, though, the last game. They won. Uh, did they? they? I thought no, they I don't think so. Oh, I thought they did. They're, they're, they're in last place in the Big Ten. Okay. They're miserable. Okay, well. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't does that matter. Make, does that only, make you miserable? No. No. <laughs> only football counts. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> only football yeah. counts. I love the selective. Yeah, okay. All that's right. right. Well, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for noticing, though. Yeah, that's green, that's nice. Away. Yeah. <laughs> Got them both. <laughs> yeah. So, well, hey, tell us a little bit about uh, what we've been covering. Kind of do a recap of the of the twelfth. Yeah. Week. So so uh, last week, yeah, this past Sunday was week six. It was the end of our series that w- that we called "Desperate for a Breakthrough: tw- The Twelve Steps." And um, you know, I w- <clears throat> I would love to talk just for a second about the the title. It's it's funny because twelve steps is not a very um, flashy nor sexy title. Um, but I was trying to think at the beginning, how do we communicate really kind of where we were going to go. And, um, and, and so the subtitle, Desperate for a Breakthrough, I think for anybody who has dealt with addiction to anything, you get to a place, uh, especially step one, where you're saying, my life's unmanageable. Um, I, you know, I can't, I, I'm powerless against my addiction, against my sin, whatever it is, that, um, that you just want out. And so that, that desperation. Now, part of why I chose that title as well is because sometimes as Christ followers we're not all that desperate for breakthrough we uh, you know we we uh, we kind of tolerate sin mm-hmm. we play with it we allow it to just be a part of our life and think ah, it's not that bad mm-hmm. and so part of why I chose that title was because I wanted I want us to have this sense of no, we need to recognize that the stakes are really high, and that we can't we can't just tolerate uh, the stuff that's destroying us. So that's kind of where we were. So so we've been through we had been through steps one through nine. I'm not going to go ahead and repeat those, but uh, yesterday we we wound it up with the last three steps, which are really kind of the ongoing process. We we could have spent a week with each one, but um, I wanted I didn't want the series to go too long. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that there is this sense that you say, okay, af- after you've come through step eight and nine, where, you're, where you make a list of who you need to make amends to, and you start that process, then what's it look like? And it really is, uh, I think steps 10, 11, and 12 uh, capture what it's like for us as followers of Jesus to live out our salvation with fear and trembling. It, you know, it's, it's, it's what we go through on a daily basis to just check and make sure that, w- that, we're, that we're in in the right kind of fellowship, the right kind of communion with God. So step 10 says, we continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. Um, that, that sense that we're, analy- we're looking at ourselves, 
doing a personal inventory. We talked a lot about that. We can maybe talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, but we recognize that, we correct it, we, we own up to it. Step 11, um, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Um, so it really is about fostering that relationship with God, with Jesus, and, and centering on what God wants, not what we want, and then living that out. And then step 12 is, haven't had a spiritual awakening as the, as the result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to others and practice these principles in, in all of our affairs. So it, it really is recognizing what God has done for us. Um, helping other people experience that same kind of freedom, that same kind of recovery, that same kind of re relief. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the end, which me basically means that you're living in recovery um, all your life. I started the I started the series just kind of talking about. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if uh, if you've thought this too or not, but um, I think for most Christians, there is this sense of if they've never been in recovery or dealt with addiction or somebody who has, it's kind of like, ah, eh, come on, you know, can't can't you just get over it? Mm. And, oh, I've and, heard that many times. And people. and yeah. um and walk away from that temptation or whatever. And um and the reality is, um, if it were that easy, we could do it with sin too, and we don't. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of the big recap. Yeah, it is interesting. I think. Um it's always easier to <laughs> look at somebody else and, and think they're the ones that have the problem, but right. we, it's harder to look right. inside, right? And I appreciated you. You know, the 12 steps, I think, is definitely something everyone can recognize, right? We understand what that process is, and I loved how you tied that into our continual sanctification process, yeah. right? It is a continual striving, um, and also, even if someone's not necessarily addicted, but you, you need to wrestle with, do I have a sin problem, though, that... Yeah, that essentially you could call that an addiction that yeah. they're not aware of, right? That they've swept under the rug. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do think, um, and I, and I've talked about this in several messages, but I think the terminology that we use, I think it's really helpful to think about our spiritual health in the context of the 12 steps, because there are things that we don't want to say about ourselves. We don't want to say, I'm an addict. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say, my life is unmanageable. Mm -hmm. I need I need it restored to sanity. What I'm doing is insane. We don't like to say that because we think I'm I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. I, you know I've I've got a strong will. I can I can con I can do this. I can conquer that. Whatever it is, and I think that there's something that's really helpful when we recognize that we are powerless apart from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, to deal with sin in our lives, and that um, our lives are probably much more of a wreck than we recognize mm -hmm. without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, a humbleness, too. Yeah. To, and I'm sure that it's not always just that uh, pride and not wanting to admit it, but sometimes it's also that I'd, if I admit it, then I might cause someone else to stumble. Or you know what I mean? Yeah. If they see if they see me as a strong Christian and yet I'm struggling with this, so I like the, the scriptures that you included to help us too. And then the confessing the sins yeah. to one another that is a healthy process. You know, obviously you choose wisely who you right. confess those sins to. Yep. A man wouldn't necessarily confess to another woman outside of his marriage, right? That would be a bad you, thing. Yes, right. Yeah. So you're wise about how you do that, but you have accountability in your life and and. Uh, and confess. Yeah, yeah and, and I think that just recognizing that that has to be a person that you trust mm -hmm. and that is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not the kind of thing that you s necessarily stand on the street corner and air your dirty laundry, mm -hmm. um, but there is something that's really healthy in saying, no, I don't have it all together. And what's funny is we think that, that um, if we communicate that we don't have it together, that that will be a negative to people who don't know Jesus, and in reality, I think it's just the opposite. It, um, most people who are not followers of Jesus don't have any trouble recognizing the hypocrisy. Mm. You say this, but you do that. Right. What's that about? <laughs> um, and and it's a much more authentic, mm. and a much more real, and a, and and just being a real person to say, nah, I don't. I don't. I know I mess up. I I know I don't have it all together, yeah. and and I'm just trying. 
I, because that's that's what they're trying to do too. Yeah. Um, but the difference is again having the Holy Spirit to help walk with you through the process. Yeah, very helpful. Well, thanks for that overview. <clears throat> we did have a few questions. That's yeah. Right. So um, let's just dive right in here. So, would character defect and sinful nature be defined as the same thing? That's that's a, that's a, a great question. You know what's funny is whenever the host says ask the question, I always say that's a really great question because <laughs> uh, because they are really really good questions. The um, yeah, I spent some time yesterday talking about the terminology character defect or defective character that's there in uh, step uh, seven, I think six seven is in there. Um, we don't like to say we have a def defective character that that um, that there's a character defect in our lives. I I do think Scripture is absolutely plain that we have a sin nature that we have a bent towards sin from the time that we're born because of Adam and Eve's sin. That's a that's a part of who we are. Um, it, it doesn't take any time at all before you have a little life that is entrusted to you that you recognize that sinful nature <laughs> because the that that little the that little person <laughs> begins to say no or mine or whatever or to to justify and you go through that process that that's a part of who we are mm -hmm. i think it's a lot easier for we who are followers of jesus to say oh yeah i have a sin nature than it is to say a defect of character. Mm. There is a defect of character, or multiple defects of character in my life. Mm. That that is much more specific and mm -hmm. personal. Um, it, when we say, "Yeah, this is part of my sin nature," that means I'm one of eight billion people on Earth that also have the same problem. If I start talking about the defects in my character, become, you it, it it's very, very personal, mm -hmm. and and okay. we don't like it. I said yesterday that, that um, that's painful. Mm -hmm. um, the I. It's funny because I don't. Sometimes I wonder, am I too vulnerable when I speak, but um, or not vulnerable enough? But this series has been, it has been painful for me to do the prep work because when you start talking about doing an inventory, and you think about, okay, how do I communicate that? Uh, Dag on, I need to do that too, and that's not fun. Mm -hmm. it, it um because you begin to look. It's just so easy to go day by day and to not think big picture. So um, I, I, I think that when we talk about defective character, that it's much more personal than just talking about your sin nature. Yeah, I agree. I appreciate that take on that as well. Well, the next question. Mm -hmm. So not sure that that this person got your point with the pieces of paper. I think you had 12 pieces of paper yep. and you yep. kind of were once. Would you kind of help um, flesh out what you were you yeah, the, the, imagery. The, the, the imagery that I tried, that I wanted to communicate, and I didn't know if it would work or not, if you could tell. One of the, one of the big picture things I think about the 12 steps that I've learned through this series is they really are micro steps. Mm -hmm. it's, um, when you look at the differences between steps two and three, steps four and five, steps six and seven, steps eight, eight and nine, yeah, they're they're just little tiny steps, but they're really important. So if you start and say, "My life's become unmanageable," um, I you know I my my sin, my addiction, I don't have any control. Um, I, I need help. Uh, I can't do it on my own. That that's an easy place to start. The next step is a, just a little one to say, maybe there's somebody something that can help me. And then step three is to say. I think I'm going to ask that person, that thing, to help me. Whether that's God, higher power, whatever it is, um, I need. Uh, not it's not just recognizing that you need help and that there is someone who can help. It's it's asking for that help. Step four, when you do that that searching and and um, <clears throat> fearless inventory of what's of what's in your life, um, that's. That's, um, that's a big step, but then asking God to correct those defects of character that are there, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big deal. I'm, I'm, I'm not as good on um, step six and seven, just recalling the, the wording of them, but it, the, step six is, is recognizing that 
that God can help, and then seven, asking him to help. Step eight, it's just a tiny step to, to it's a big step, but it's, a, uh, it's just the next step to say, my, my defects of character have impacted other people. And, um, and so I need, I've, I've got to come to a place that I recognize what, what I've done, and a willingness to make amends, mm -hmm. just a willingness to make amends. It's not just recognizing that I've hurt other people, being willing. Well, the, the distance between step eight and nine is tiny to say, yeah, I'm willing and I'm going to. Um, the, the, the beauty, I think, of the 12 steps is that they are really small steps. Mm -hmm. But we tend to think in terms of, hey, you know, when, when you hit bottom, when you crash and burn, just get well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. just, just stop it. Um, it, mm -hmm. it really is kind of that, that sense of, oh, you got a problem with drinking? Just stop. Uh, you got a problem with sin? You got a pro problem with porn? Just stop. Um, and... And the beauty of the 12 steps is that it's tiny steps that get us from one end of the stage to the other. Um, and, and, and that each one of those steps are hugely significant, but they're incremental that ultimately we have to go through those things mm -hmm. in, order to, in order to experience transformation. Yeah. I've been studying and um, teaching a, a learning model for many years now, a um, couple decades. And part of that, once you recognize where you want to go, you know, say you want to get healthy or whatever, and you've set your, when you're setting your goals to be sure that your goals are reasonable and incremental, because if not, when you try to go from A to Z all at once, your brain starts saying, I can't, because you fail. Right. And so, right. therefore, you keep reinforcing the fail. But if you make those incremental steps, you start to have that incremental success, which propels you to continue, right, down that step. So I, I really appreciated yeah. the 12 steps that you were a, a in couple the visual. Of, I, a couple of years ago, um, I was at uh, a training event for Global Leadership Summit. Craig Rochelle, who's the pastor at Life Church in Oklahoma City, uh, Church of... I don't know, 35 campuses or something like that, 100,000 people mm -hmm. that, that are a part of, of, of their church. And somebody asked, how are you so disciplined? Because he's like in his 50s and he is... Very fit. He's very fit. <laughs> yeah, his body looks like he's in his 20s right. or whatever. And, and, and they said, how are you so disciplined? And, and he said, that's a really funny question because he said, I'm completely undisciplined. Huh. However... The key for me is brushing my teeth. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, what are you talking about? He said, when I get up in the morning, if I brush my teeth, I think, hey, I brushed my teeth. I'm, a, I'm doing the right thing. He said, and that sets the, that sets the stage for me to be able to have um, devotions with my wife. It sets the stage for me to be able to have prayer time by myself. It sets the stage for me to be able to do everything else that happens. He said, but if I get up and I'm kind of in another world um, and I don't brush my teeth and I wander out in the living room, he said, the whole day's shot hmm. because, because I can't get back uh, in control of my day because of that one decision. But if, if I brush my teeth, then I make the bed, then, then I'm kind to of my wife. It's hmm. tiny steps. Little, yep. yep, tiny little steps matter. Yep. matter. Absolutely. Yep. Hmm. And that and that decision to be self disciplined, right? right? Yeah. We, yeah. Otherwise it's Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well the next question. Is one of the three types of inventory that you uh, mentioned more important or better than one of the others? So I talked about in, in uh, step, uh, step 10, it says we continue to take personal inventory. When we were wrong, we admitted it. I talked about three different kinds of inventory, uh, kind of a spot check that happens just as you go through the day, that you're all the, all the time kind of aware of the choices that you make, how they impact um, yourself and others. Uh, a daily inventory that that typically I think most people would do at the end of the day to just kind of analyze the day and think through, okay, how did I do today? Was today better than yesterday, worse than yesterday? How'd that go? Or the thorough inventory. I, th I think probably all three are really important, um, depending on how you're wired. Um, I do think, and and this is uh, this may have come through in the message if uh, if you. If, if I either said this or you kind of read between the lines, I think that the thorough inventory 
is really important because that's not something that we tend to do. We tend to not be that introspective. We tend, or maybe it's just me, you live in the moment. And, um, and so it's important, I think, periodically to either get away or to just make the time to say to to take a step back and say, okay, how am I really doing? How, how um, what really is going on in my life? And and so from that aspect, I think the thorough inventory um, there's tremendous benefit to that. And then if you go back to step four, where you talk about doing a a, um, a searching and fearless inventory of every aspect of your life, uh, step eight when you're when you're talking about um, really taking a look at everyone that you've hurt and being willing to make amends, um, that's a part of that thorough inventory that happens. And I think if I, you know, if, if we go back to, to Daniel when he was sharing his story um, in, in the message several weeks ago, uh, he, he kind of said, when people hit bottom, when they, when they really get to steps one, two, and three, that the only way they get there is, is by having some sense of how how off course their life has become. Mm-hmm. And that come that's that ties into that thorough inventory. You don't typically think, oh man, my life is a wreck if you're only looking at what's happened in the last 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, all three are really important. Mm-hmm. Um, but my encouragement um, is I think for Christ followers, a thorough inventory periodically is really, really important because it's easy to drift, mm-hmm. um, to drift away from Jesus, to drift away from what really matters. Um, I think for people in recovery, like I, I know a lot of people, I have a lot of friends who've, who've said, you know, I, um, I've, been, I've been clean and sober for 23 years or 17 years or whatever it is. Um, I think for many people who have been in recovery, recovery for a long time, it's really important to do a thorough inventory again, again, because it's easy to drift. You may not, you may not be drinking, you may not be using, you may not be caught up in, in whatever your addiction is, but you may have become complacent about the things that drove you to the addiction mm. in the first place, the back to the dry drunk um, kind of thing. I was actually thinking of that. I know a couple of examples of people who've shared with me people in their lives that exhibit some negative characteristics. They're not drinking, but they're acting as, I mean, it's just as aggressive or this, 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 there's some issues there. Yeah. <laughs> Sin issues, however you want to talk about character defects yeah. that are not being addressed because the person is overlooking and saying, well, I'm not drinking. You know? Yeah. So Again, I, 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 the rest yeah. of us, we yeah. can, well, I'm not doing this, but you know, but yeah. I'm doing you this. Justify, just, I'm, I'm, I'm not using, I'm not drinking. So everything must be good. When in reality, there's there's havoc yeah. uh, in their life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So good, good challenges. I think for for all of us, no matter what we're dealing with, right? There's, yeah, there's something for all of us. Um, and I'm glad this next question came up because I think this would be a good opportunity for you to kind of just um, clarify any potential confusion. But the question is, should we not pray for things that we care about? Because I think you were just you you know kind of um, talking about well we. We ask for the things that we want, and I think you were really well. I'll let you go no, deeper. No, go, go ahead. Well, you were really, I think, alluding to: are we are we always Holy Spirit led, asking what the Spirit wants us to, or are we asking for what we want? <laughs> Maybe not necessarily what we need, right? Yeah, that's what you're and, getting at. and and um, again, this this process is the deepest I've I've ever done into the twelve steps. And I think that the wording that's in step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Um, the, uh, th- that, that language just really challenged me because if we pray only for knowledge of God's will, God just just show me what your will is. That's so different than the way most of us pray. Because we, when we pray, we ask for strength, we ask for courage, we ask for boldness, we ask for healing, we ask for um, comfort, we ask for peace, we ask for whatever. Um, we ask for escape from difficult situations, when in reality, God's will may be very 
much for us to stay in that discomfort so that we learn the stupid lesson that he's trying to teach us mm -hmm. rather than just him removing us from from whatever that situation is mm -hmm. and um and so uh, yeah let me let me just be clear god cares about every aspect of our life every aspect of our life um and and he wants us to talk to him about that but I think there is tremendous growth and maturity when we begin to say, God, you know what's going on. Can you, just, can you just lead me and show me what to do? Show me what to say. Show me how to act. Show me what to do. Because I want what you want, not what I want. I want what you want with my mom who's in the hospital. I want what you want with, um, with this broken relationship that exists between two of my friends. Um, that's a that's a completely different kind of mindset and a completely different kind of prayer than saying, God, would you just fix that? Uh, you know, would would you just resolve that? Um, and 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 so and so that anxiety, that tension, that discomfort is out of my life. So um, again, God cares about every aspect of our lives, and He wants us to talk uh, to Him about that. But I think that there's but we recognize tremendous maturity in ourselves when we say, God, it's not, it's not about what I want. Um, it, can you just show me what, what your plan is in this process and how I can be a part of that? That was, yeah, that was a great, great question and glad that you shed a little more light on that for us. Thank you. Very last question we have here. So how do we know who to talk to if we want help? Um, and, and maybe want someone else to come along and know Jesus or to begin recovery? So, so I think that this question is, it really, um, it has to do with step 12. Um, we, we try to carry this message to others to practice these principles in all of our affairs. How do, how do you know um, who to share your story with that can help them? Um, I, I think that that starts with prayer. God, who, who do you who do you want me to to have a conversation with? And and what's cool is God brings people into your life that you may not expect at all. Like you're thinking, oh, that's going to be this person or this person yeah. or this person. And all of a sudden, yeah, you either have a chance encounter or somebody from the past or somebody at work says, hey, can I talk for a second? And and you're thinking, no, I don't have time for you. Oh, wait, yeah, I prayed that that God would bring someone to do that. Um, I think it's interesting that in the steps that, um, that, the, that you seek out a sponsor, a sponsor doesn't seek out you. If that if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, so you speak out, you, you you seek out someone to mentor you to be an accountability partner. Not somebody comes to you and says, "I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you." Yeah. Um, uh, that, uh, that's 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 just kind of crazy. But I do think that when we pray, and when we see people in pain, that that um, that we that God allows us to step in and and be able to share, not that you have to dump everything on them, but but to just share, man, I have been where you are, and if it would help to talk, I would love to tell you my story. Yeah. Um, and to be an encouragement, right? Yeah. Not necessarily to have to force yourself as yes. a mentor or the, yeah. this, you know, the savior in this situation, but yeah. Yeah. It's never, sharing your story is never a weapon. Yeah. Uh, it, it's never a club that you beat people with, mm -hmm. but that it, I think it happens typically in the context of relationship. Um, and and the more you are aware of what's going on in other people's lives, the more God can use you to, to help that happen. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Very good. Well, I think that is a wrap of episode 127. 127. North Point Plus podcast. So um, obviously, we just appreciate it. If you got something out of this, if you would like us on Facebook and uh, I don't know. Share it. Yeah, and uh, share it appropriately. Uh, yeah. or, or leave comment in the bottom. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah the, we would um, love to hear what you Yeah, what it's, you it's fun. Um, and... Um, I think that this is cool. Uh, we, you know, I don't know if anybody pays any attention, uh, any attention to it, but about, I think percentage-wise, probably somewhere between 20 and 25 percent 
of the adults who come to North Point watch the podcast. Wow, which cool. is which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I I, I One know out of every four. Yeah, um, I, I it creates great conversation in our life group, in my in my life group, and yeah. I think it. I don't think it's just because it's the life group I'm part of. I I think people are listening in it and it has them thinking about stuff in a good way. So yeah, shout out to the McKay Life Group, McKay <laughs> Rubel Life Group. Go green. <laughs> Go Bucks. <laughs> That's a wrap.